Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT racers to discuss their lives, their journeys, and their relationship with the greatest motorsporting event in the world. As ever, with me is the legend Steve Plater. Steve, how are we doing? Hey, it's been a while, Chris. No, hey. good. I'm from very well, thanks. All over the Christmas festivities and still smiling. Oh, that's long gone. We've, we've managed to lose all that... That Christmas fat, and we're, we're we're lean and ready for race season. We've got an empty chair over here, as you can see. Who shall we fill it with today? Who would we like to see on the podcast? Hey, there's quite a few people mm. that would be very interesting. It'd be quite nice to hear your opinions as well of who you'd like. But for me, a very special person today. Yeah, tell us then. The Batley Man, Clive Paget. Right, I'm going to keep this intro short because we're going to have so much to talk about. Me and Steve were talking prior to you getting here. There's going to be so much we want to talk about. So rather than me give you this massive intro, we're probably going to cover it all in the podcast. But before we start, I want to read out a few names. Mike Halewood, Phil Reed, Ron Aslam, Jim Moody, Dave Leach, Phil Meller, Mick Grant, Robert Dunlop, Cameron Donald, John McGuinness, Dan Need, Ian Hutchinson, most recently, Connor Cummins, Davey Todd. Did I miss anybody out, Steve? Have you got Bruce Anstey on there? Bruce Anstey. Anyone else, Steve? Um, hello. <laughs> oh, and, yep. Fourth. Yeah, there's there's not been many riders that you've not had under you, and there's not been many of those riders that haven't won a TT. It's, That's right. It's, um, it's unbelievable. Please include on that list my own brother, Gary Padgett. He won two. Gary Padgett. So let's have Gary on there. Well, I, yep. <clears throat> I mean, we could be just listing names for the yeah. next hour of, of people that have that have ridden for you, but but like you say, there's there's been some amazing names, and like I said, most of them have won, and some yeah. of them will probably go on to 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 win a TT. Clive Paget, welcome to the TT podcast. Um, I don't know if you listen to it, but there's a tradition with this podcast that we start the the podcast with the same question, normally to riders, sometimes team managers, about the tap on the shoulder. Obviously, it's slightly different for you. You're a team manager. You're sat there watching your riders. Leave the grid. Yeah. So yeah. how does that how does that differ as you've gone on throughout the years, and how does it still feel now watching the likes of Davey and Connor sat on the grid, knowing that they're that your bike's under them and they're setting off on a on a senior TT doesn't differ it's never ever changed to this day the moment that that man taps the shoulder the boys see the light change or the flag off they go down bray hill and their nerves have gone instantly steve will concur with that right up to that moment when you're rolling through he's wanted to wear his pants he's <laughs> we're nervous we're anxious but i'm still wearing my pants and anxious and nervous for the next six laps yeah, is it like that four laps absolutely and, you know, I've had recently people say, you know, we're silver hair now and less hair and all the rest of it. And people say, will you retire? You will know when it's the day to retire because I won't wake up nervous. I'll want to eat my breakfast. And right now I wake up just feeling as they do. I feel sick. I'm anxious. My tummy's in bits because is everything right? Have I got that right? How can we gain another point one getting to Glen Ellen? You know, what, what can we do? Look at the weather. Do we leave that gearing on? Should we change it? What about tyre pressures? You know, it's all... It, it's just how we're built, you know, and I can't change that. What, what, what's amazing about that is, you, I, I don't know what it's like with the rest of the team bosses, but you probably won't get a team boss thinking that. They'd leave that to somebody else. But I think we'll probably find that in the podcast. Just And I spoke to Davey about this. How much of a family unit Paget's is, probably more so than it is actually a team. Yeah, I, I, th I think so, you know. I mean, and I've got my dad and Uncle Don to thank for that. You know, they were innovators that they were uh, pioneers in their industry first of all to take the japanese brands on when they first came into uk you know around the 1960 uh, my dad's the longest yamaha dealer longest honda dealer longest suzuki dealer in the whole of the uk as a dealership and that's quite something because taking those brands on back then against your ags matchless norton triumph that was like uh, without being rude to the chinese brands like taking the chinese on 10 years ago mm -hmm. you know it was a big gamble and um Fortunately, you made it such a huge success, and all I've done is slipstream them and learnt from the best. Well, I mean, big boots to fill. But so take us all the way back then, when you were were a small child, and the and the dealership was opening up. You know, were they always into racing and, and motorbikes prior to that? Yeah, it was strange. My dad actually raced prior to him starting his business. You know, dad worked at a motorcycle dealership for about seven years. Then he went in the national service, did the national service, and he went back to the dealership. Great dealership, actually. Their family now buys bikes from us. They've closed their dealership. They sold their Leeds premises. Um, but the 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 
the, the passion was always in him. And it wasn't that my granddad was a biker. It was, I mean, dad was the pusher and the driver and force. And, you know, uh, dad won the British Clubman's Championship back in 1961. Um, and just the family, we love it. The grandkids love it. The, my daughters love it. My missus loves it. It's just, I don't know, we, it, it's there. It's in the DNA somewhere. So, yeah, so what, what, like you say, where, where <clears> does that racing element come from because i can look back i guess it's the same with you steve i look back and i go my dad my dad got me into racing i want to jump in there because you know it's like i just touched on um what you said obviously uh, with with the the hand on the shoulder at the start but too many people you know you watch so many things different other podcasts and publications and commentators and too many people class clive as a team manager clive was a classy rider high level rider mm -hmm. uh but, but, and your career was cut short clive mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. And that's where the passion was from. Yeah, I think that's where the passion is come from. I unfortunately got injured when my bike seized up in Belgium at 19. And um, I'm still 19 in my head. I want to be that man going down Bray Hill. I want to be that man, you know, whipping through quarry bends. But that's not the case. So I do it with these guys and I love them all to bits. You know, our, our, the way it operates, yeah, we are. Davis summed it up. It is a family team. It's a love. It's a cuddle. It's a hug. Um, and go and have some fun. Yeah, so let's go back to that <clears> racing <throat> career then. I, I read in the stats, I haven't got them to hand, but did I read 27 wins in your first year as a, as a racer within 15 meetings? That's Yeah, it's hard to talk impressive. about yourself because that's not really fair and it's such a long time ago. Well, but, you're going to have to. You're going to um, have to, Clive. Yeah. We, I did, hey, I'm with you. I'm yeah. the same. Okay. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. I um, love it. I did 14 race meetings one season, got rid of the orange jacket. The following season, I did the... BSB as it was it wasn't BSB then it was ACU Star I think they call it but it was the British Championship and I actually won the Tooth to British Championship of Charlie finished second Charlie Williams finished second so as a 17 18 year old kid that was quite incredible to do I'll remind him of that yeah. oh, <laughs> um, and uh, it did go down to the last race it yeah. was whoever won the last race and I, I won so that you know happened to be that it was me and then the following season I went and did Grand Prix and um, things were going great finished it top six in Grand Prix. As I was going to say, you weren't, you weren't just doing Grand Prix, you were, you were a class act. Yeah, yeah I, when I finished sixth up in Sweden, the previous year's world champion finished seventh, so that is an indication of yeah. where we were going, but then uh, my bike seized in Belgium and... Um, that was a road, road circuit, Clive. It was yeah. a road circuit, yeah, <clears throat> but very safe where I fell off, Steve, it was on a straight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I've got a I've got a clip uh, from YouTube on on my iPad from that circuit. I didn't know anything about right. it, and I've been watching flipping heck, mate. But and from that from that year, actually seventy eight, I believe it was seventy eight. Uh, yeah. God, dear, just everything was just one bale at the side of the track and oh, some circuit. Well, I believe I not believe uh, the year after that they had some real serious sight car accidents and so on, and and then it was stopped after that. But you know, you when I was injured, my brother was only fifteen, my mechanic. So Steve. Uh, took uh, the um, uh, the van and the caravan to the hospital at night because Susan had gone in the ambulance with me, the air ambulance had gone with another uh, Australian lad, uh, Ray Quincy at the time, another very good rider, um, and that had taken Ray off because he fell down on the first lap. But the following year, yeah, the, and but sorry, back to it, yeah, there were some real um, Steve Parrish, Will Hartog, Takizumi Katayama, world Katayama, champions yeah. of the day, you know, they, <clears> they were at the event. It was just, it was a high-level event, but uh, it was a street circuit, yeah. So so, how do we get into? <clears throat> obviously, it's changed a lot, uh, Grand Prix, and what I guess we'll get onto team management and and TT. But getting into Grand Prix back then didn't sound as hard as it potentially is nowadays, was it? Or um, were you were you? I know it, Steve it, keeps saying that you were talented, but can you buy a ride there? Can you as a privateer? Could you have no, got in? Very very different back in the day. Normally, about seventy odd people would be out there trying to qualify, and right. then the top thirty six would be on the grid. Um, I remember the first <clears throat> Grand Prix I did down in um, Harama and we'd travelled down there without a ride and, and, and Kenny, Kenny Roberts and myself sat on this little step outside this little office trying to get a ride and um, Kenny had done some Grand Prix the year before but the guy came back after lunch one day and pointed at me, you, you can have a ride boy, so I went, in his Spanish of course, um, I went in and um, he, he gave me a ride and do you have a 500? And I didn't. So we just took yellow plates on my 350 and went in, out in the 500 Grand Prix, but I wasn't going to go to Spain and not go around. Um, <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then it went on from there and, and it, it was it was all good, you know, from, from we, like I said, it's hard to talk about yourself, but from February to August that year, mm. I only fell down once, this was it. Um, you know, I never crashed, never fell off a motorbike, um, and that was 
riding at a reasonable level. Um, so, in fact, two days after this ha happened, Honda Japan offered us factory bikes. So that was a bit, you know, novel. But it wasn't it wasn't to be because the nerve damage was already, you know, there. Yeah. So, uh, but so hey. just on on that, club, obviously, when, when the bike sees you jumped off and and uh, and damaged your arm, you obviously as well medically things weren't as switched on then as they are now. That's right. Know, especially <clears> so. How soon was it after the the accident in Belgium did you realise that it was game over for for winning anyway? Yeah. Uh, I don't think you ever want to admit it's over, do you? No. Nope. Um, so you know you've been there and. Um, uh, so I don't think I ever accepted it was over and eventually after 18 months or so I had my 21st birthday out in New Zealand um, because uh, I don't know if I should share all of this but Dennis Ireland had said a prolific rider at the time very good rider Dennis won TT gave me a couple of addresses and bear in mind there was no mobile phones look get yourself out to New Zealand you'll be able to ride out there okay lovely and um Neil and I had been out to Macau, Neil Tuxworth and I went to Macau, and then I went on from there to New Zealand, not knowing anybody, knocked on the first door that <laughs> Dennis had given me an address for, very, I wouldn't say naive, just very determined, got out there and little boy comes to the door and said, hey, oh, well, my mum's renting this house, she's fell out with my dad. <laughs> okay, lovely, oh, sorry, to, sorry to hear that. And so I went to the next house and the grass is up above the window, so I thought, well, there's, I don't know what to do, I'll sleep on a bench. And I'm hitchhiking along the road, and a car stopped and picked me up, and it was a guy from Halifax. But he said, look, I can't put you up, lad, but I know a golf club. You can lose your bags, and I've got my leathers in a bag and things. But again, I'd gone with no motorbike. I had nothing to go to. Just your leathers and Just a my leathers and a helmet. Brilliant. No motorbike. Nobody to meet up to get a bike from. Went to uh, not went back to this house, rang the house up, obviously not on a mobile. And the lad answered the phone again. He said, um, oh, my mum said if you rang back, you could come and stay. So lovely. So I went around this house and she said, I don't have a spare bed, love, but I've got a beanbag in the corner and sleep on the beanbag. And lovely. Thank you so much. Got up the next morning, ready to leave. And because I thought they'd want to leave and go to work and things, boys go to, boy and girl do school. And um, mum said, no, you don't have to leave. You can stay. There's Kiefer House. What? But this is New Zealand, bear in mind. <laughs> yeah. And what a lovely gesture. <laughs> lovely. So I stayed there kicking around for a week or so. And she took a car in for service and she, um, she was having a radio fitted, actually. And she said to this man, Dave, um, oh, I've got a race of staying at my house. Bum, bum, bum. That went on from the fact he told it. I think I've heard of him. He rang his mate. His mate rings me up at the house. I'll be around this afternoon. You pick my, ride my boy, boy's bike at Rupuna. So I jumped on his bike, went out, had a run round. Um, had to Velcro my hand to the wrist because my fingers were still paralysed at the time. So I just <laughs> had to use back brake. And um, we went round on his motorbike and it all seemed pretty good. I later realised why I went pretty okay that afternoon i've been on a bike for 18 months um and that night the boys the the man's on the phone alan bramwell lovely lovely man and um alan ringing i've got this one arm palm and he's beating my lads <laughs> like record around Rupuna. <laughs> and i went on a radio show and somebody volunteered to lend me a motorbike so i went and picked this bike up it was a few years old but got round it built it did it whatever and uh uh, the the man whose uh, car radio was being fitted, oh sorry, the man that was fitting the car radio, he'd previously been involved with Lotus. Got involved with him. He helped me rig a rear brake up that had a potentiometer, a potentiometer, sorry, a regulator in to stop the rear brake overworking. We put two brake pedals on it. Outside one worked the front brake. Press them both worked the both brakes again because I couldn't use the front brake. Mm. And um, we went racing. And the very first race back last corner I was trying to take the lead unfortunately I fetched us both down totally my fault I couldn't stop and um, <laughs> uh, and after that I stayed out there three months never won a motorbike race finished second finished fifth was the worst realized I couldn't ride a bike again came home and started doing what we do now looking after people so how how hard was it to to kind of turn your back on it and realize that you couldn't do it because again it looked it looked like you were you had the potential to to be world class and to go and be, you know, competing with the likes of Barry Sheen, Kenny Roberts, and, and fighting for championships? Well, funnily enough, actually, when I won the King of Brands, Barry had won it the year before. Um, so, yeah, funnily mentioned Barry. Yeah. Barry helped me a lot, actually. Barry was really kind to me, taught me how to start a bike better, got me some clothing deals, and, yeah, a, a great guy, actually. Now, you could spend days talking about that man, in fact, weeks. Yeah. But um, uh, it was real hard, actually. It took a lot of accepting, mm. because, you know, it's all I've ever dreamed about was riding a motorbike um, and my attention turned to my brother Gary 
we started to help Gary. We, Gary was already racing. Gary started racing on a sidecar, actually, as a sidecar passenger to Ken, who worked at the shop. Uh, Ken ran the shop, Ken Mishida. And um, uh, so Gary was into racing. Then it flicked across to solos, but we got more and more and pushed. And, and Gary, again, you know, real talent. 19 years old, went to the Manx Grand Prix, brought the lap record, actually won the newcomers race by four and a bit minutes over four laps. Wow. And broke the lap record while in the, the lap record, not the uh, not the newcomers lap record, yeah. but brought the lap record, leading the, the proper race. And unfortunately, we stopped. We, we didn't finish that race. Um, and then Gary went on to win a couple of Isle of Man TTs, very successful. Um, but unfortunately, we lost my brother on a road bike, so that's... Uh, yeah, 18 miles an hour, the Bobby said he was doing, which is no speed, but, sure. you know, you can fall off a curb and um, bang your head and you're out of it. That's it, you can go so, on, yeah. Um, yeah that, that was a public, a TT, uh, public road climb. Public road, yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah, yeah, nine cool. days after his last TT win. But, uh, so, hey, we're thinking of you, bro. But, mm. uh, yeah. Sure. Um, and then from Gary, uh, well, whilst we were helping Gary, you know, the likes of Phil Meller, and we, was, we were still heavily involved with other people. It wasn't just to focus on my brother. Um, some great times and TT wins with Phil. Um, bless his heart as well, actually. Um, but uh, must yeah, must have been tough for you, for your dad, Clive, as well, uh, for Peter. You know, to going through obviously everything from. Yeah. You know, uh, it's tough anyway when you're working with somebody and you're close to them. But being family as well, it must have been really hard to see that happen to your kids. Uh, uh, unbelievable, um, for any parent that loses, you know, a child. I do remember at um, at John Newbold's funeral, Morris said to my dad. He said, Peter, this is the wrong way around, you know, we're not, it's not meant to be in this order, you know, and it is, it's just the wrong way around, it's the only way to put it. Mm -hmm. And um, no, it, it still felt very hard to this day, but uh, we've gone on from there, we've supported many other people and, you know, cuddled them, loved them, brought them through the bad times, helped them, because, you know, even motorcycle racers have a bad day, you know, every day they wake up, they're not feeling it, sometimes how, they've got to inspire that. How you know? do you, you know, people talk about obviously <clears throat> Rossi and his massive long career and being fast for the biggest part of it, but how do you keep the motivation, is it, is it the winning side? How do you keep the motivation know. to carry on and be so enthusiastic? You are by, I, by far the most enthusiastic team person in any paddock not just road racing mm -hmm. you know neil said that to me the other day neil rang me real, neil tuxworth and uh, neil said just the same thing he said like a 16 year old <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I really don't know I, I just love all of it whether it be the development deciding which camshafts we're going to run which exhausts we're running which bell mouths you know and the whole uh, you know which front forks uh the, the, i enjoy driving there i enjoy sleeping in the camper and and you know i'd be happy if we went club racing at Cadwell again mm -hmm. it's a paddock yeah. um, and you know we are going back to BSB this year Superbike with Davey after winning the championship last year but that's for Davey we're doing that solely and wholly for Davey because it's the next step on the ladder for him it's the next step in his career and he did have other offers to go to other teams in BSB Superbike he said I want to you know I, I want to stay with you guys I don't want to go anywhere else please tell me that I'm with you then I can tell these guys I've got a ride mm -hmm. and we're doing that for Davy, and I just hope we do it well for him. You know, we'll be trying hard anyway. I'm sure he'll do. He'll he'll do exactly the same, won't he? Let's he let's <clears> let's. <throat> we'll come on to him later because I want to talk about him and him and Connor. But just just going back and and working with your brother was was it an intentional shift to become a manager, or did you just go there, help him out, help him out, and then it started to develop into that role, and you realised that's where you, you, you clearly that's where your strengths laid. Yeah. I don't think anything, it wasn't intentional. It wasn't just the same back then anyway. And also teams, you know, when I went racing, um, I saw it written down somewhere that we were certainly the youngest team ever in the paddocks. It was myself at 19, 18, 19, Susan at 18, 19. That's uh, my missus. And, and my brother, Alan, 15. My dad would come to the occasional race, but he was back home still trying to build a business, you know, make a go of something. Um, he, he couldn't take all the time off work. So you virtually, I was running my own team, when we're going racing um and that was the, how it was done then though it wasn't it, you know, it wasn't only me it was everybody yeah. in the paddock you didn't have a team manager tom heron your john eckerold your you know whoever it might be your anton mang whoever that may have been okay when anton got a factory ride uh, with kawasaki by the way they offered me that before him but that's another story <laughs> um and uh, uh it, it it, it wasn't any different. It's evolved to the way it is now, hasn't it, Steve? You know, yeah. you, you didn't have yep. a team manager in the early days, did you? No. Nope. It's just no. evolved. So, and all these titles, you know, and I was 
chatting to Leon on the way here this morning, Leon Camier, and he was, oh, and so and so's technical director. And I said, we're just still a bunch of mates going racing. Yeah. And, you know, none of our guys have a title. And, and something we were talking about yesterday, none of our, the 16 or 17 years now, not one of our team staff has ever left. They're my friends. They've really? not gone somewhere else. Not one team member. We've had some join, and they may have only been with us 12 years, but nobody's left. It's quite something. That, that, that speaks volumes and, to, to you and, and yeah. the team, clearly, um, doesn't it? And the culture. I'm so chuffed with it because all of my friends that work with us, thank you guys, we couldn't do it without you, all the success, all the hard work. It just seems to come so easy, though. It doesn't look like you're out there trying to do it. It just it just is, isn't it? It's it's well, just a family. Uh, again, we were chatting, you know, uh, at the TT last year, five of our team members had all raced the Alaman TT course, either at the TT or at the Manx Grand Prix, yeah. but they'd ridden, that competed, that stood on Bray Hill, that stopped that, that seen that man drop the flag. Um, and they felt those nerves. They know what it's like to be there. So they know what it's like when you pull into the pits. They know what you're feeling. They know what, it, you know, help the fellas, let's get it right. Um, and uh, I, I think that's a big part of it, you know. We understand what the guys are going through when they wake up on race day morning. Mm -hmm. well, you know, away from the TT side, uh, when you're coming through, obviously you're helping Gary and so on and you're moving forward from there. But obviously, Paget's racing were were quite a big name in Grand Prix racing, yeah. you know, which is which is a big thing. And obviously, that's that's obviously uh, relates through to the business. You know, um, if you if you need anything for a two stroke, you just ring Clive Paget that's because right. he'll know he'll tell you exactly on the Padgett phone or, what yeah. what jet, yeah. what what part it needs and, and what shelf it's on in the flipping shop. <laughs> um, but but yeah, but which is quite a big thing because a massive depth in in Grand Prix racing. You had some strong riders there as well. Yeah, certainly and. You know, I don't know how that's come about either. It's um, it just all evolved. It was there was no major plan. There was no fancy plan to. Oh, it, it just evolved. That's the only way I can say it. You know, whether, you know, when we ran Darren back in nineteen um, eighty eight, Darren Dixon, Mark Phillips had won the again. I'm going to call it BSB because I forget what it was called then. But we won the British Championship with Mark Phillips back in eighty six. Then we finished third to Mark with Mark in 87 and we won it again with Darren in 88 but when the captain won it in 86 you know it was against your Foggy and your Whittam and your Rhymer and your Rent it wasn't uh, you good know, rider uh, good yeah, rider incredible rider Matt Phillips and again another man that unfortunately didn't get to see his full potential down the line um, but uh, you know we were watching at Cadwell I'm watching at the top of the mountain and I see this guy running around on a, on a GPX uh, Kawasaki Darren Dixon and he wasn't up the front but I thought, that I can ride a bike. And we put him on a bike for the following season. Um, first round of the uh, British Championship, he went and won it. Um, we then won all six televised rounds and finished second in the two that weren't televised. Another very, very incredible motorcycle rider on anything, two wheels and three wheels. Um, so none of it, none of it, you know, whether you go back to your Dave Leach, I start, Dave was a customer, him and his dad. And... Uh, I started going to a meeting with Dave just to help them as friends and family. They weren't part of our family, but just he was a nice customer, and we went and started helping him, and then we put him on our bike, and the year after my brother uh, died, we put Dave on our bikes at the TT, and again, it evolved, and Dave had some blinking good wins. Um, so some of these are household names to TT riders or to TT enthusiasts, but uh, may not be on short circuits, but nothing was a plan. It all just evolved through... Yeah, I don't know, uh, but it evolved in a good way. So, Clive, you know, through through all of your racing disciplines, um, you always see a great atmosphere yeah, with your teams, but who's been the most difficult rider to work with, to bring the best out of? Oh, it had to be Steve Plater. Absolute <laughs> nightmare. Oh, <bloody> <laughs> um, no, I think once you understand people's personalities their idiosyncrasies their their little bits the way that you might describe something to me as a bit of front end feel and the way john might describe it or ian or bruce or uh, connor davy you all have your own ways of putting things across and um i think providing you know you, you can explain to you guys that the bike's pretty much in the zone you know she's working in that field there if we go there it doesn't work if we go there it doesn't work and there's always tweaks and you know, um, uh, and that's not the question you asked, but it, it sums up. I think you have to understand your rider. Yeah. And if you understand your rider, you're not going to have any difficult times. And if that guy walks in on a morning and he's got his face on the deck, 
with the greatest respect, he might not have told you in the week that his grandma passed away or his dog got knocked down. Mm -hmm. or And there's, a, there's often a reason for things. You know, you can't expect anyone to perform at the best when there's something just back here telling them, what a rubbish week I've had, you know, girlfriend bumped a car or, and come, what's, what's happening today, Steve? What's the problem? Oh, I had a bit of a rough week, you know, and providing you, that's the way we run our team. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I'm probably recovering the same ground that you guys have said, but it's, it's providing you can help your rider. You're not going to have too many difficult times. Go on then, Steve. What was it like riding for Clive? <sighs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, <laughs> mega, you know, really, it's, it's such a good atmosphere, you know. Um, obviously, Clive knows what Clive knows what he's doing, mm -hmm. but it's not just about Clive. It's everybody around him, including his family, his daughters, you know, other team members. Just, it's just a good atmosphere, even when things aren't going great or. Well, you got the hump because you haven't performed well yourself. It's still brilliant. It's still a good atmosphere and a good uh, good time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know if I'm talking out of turn when I say this, but it seems that riders would would prefer and feel more comfortable in in Clive's team than potentially in that Honda factory team. You know, everyone always dreams of the Honda factory, but I I dare say that we wouldn't have got the best out of Davy that we saw if he was if he was somewhere else. <clears throat> Very true. I think that depends on the individual as well, Clyde, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it does depend on the individual. And of course, David did a season with, you know, with Honda um, and they put a great team together and it's very corporate, but that's how it has to be in their yeah, world. Of course, yeah. You know, we can run it a bit different. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the um, uh, 209 with some great results with Steve, but 210, we had a podium at every BSB 600 round we did, didn't we, mate? Until yeah. the fateful off in the wet at uh, Thruxton. Um and uh, yeah, so you know, great results. And as you say, if, if a rider, if you can see a rider's beating himself up, then again, I've never been cross that a rider's not had a great result. I'll, how do we improve on that? What what was it? Is it something on the motorcycle? Is it you know? Did you get a bad start? Was it? Are you just not feeling it today? There are many reasons uh, that a rider might have an off day. You know, there'll be mornings that you come into work, Chris, and you'll think, "Oh, my throat's a bit croaky today. I could do without doing this. I could yeah. have, could have laid in bed another hour." Well, that'd be nice. um, there we Today, go. Yeah. Um, and and the motorcycle race has noticed. Yeah. Who do you go and see then when when you're when you're waking up and you're like, ah, oh, just not feeling uh, it today. Susan gives me a cuddle. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm missing, Steve. Uh, yeah. I need a Susan in my She's, life. Su Susan's been giving me a cuddle for 46 years. We met at school, and that's it. I love it a bit. So she's the real boss, then. Yeah, man, that's it. You know it. It's the same the world <laughs> over. Uh, yeah, yeah. Steve's the same with Vicky. We all know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you what, he's, he's getting some brownie yeah. points here. <laughs> and he does. Let's hope she listens to it. I mean it, though. <laughs> the one thing I want to talk about, and, and, and I find it fascinating, is the, um, the connection you have with, with HRC, because... I'm right in thinking that you're the only place where someone can go and get their factory Honda serviced outside of Japan. Yeah, back in 1993, uh, Honda uh, awarded us as the first Honda racing service shop uh, in the whole world outside of Japan, which was a real accolade, you mm. know, and to, be, to, be, to achieve that was something else. Um, and we've been really proud of that over the years. And um, then... Much more recently, um, Honda changed the way in which they were marketing and selling the RC213 VSs because originally that went through a Genpo, i.e. The, the import. If you wanted one in Italy, you bought it through the Honda importer in Italy. If you wanted one in Japan, bought it from the Honda uh, Japan, su not supplier, but Honda Japan themselves. Mm -hmm. Honda Britain, it came through Honda Britain. But they changed that after they had the earthquake over there and you know the bikes weren't all completed. And they asked Paget, would they sell the remaining RC213 VS and again what an accolade mm. we've chosen as that dealer in the world it, what an honour their flagship motorbike that makes me tingle now <laughs> yeah and you you decide to take them to the TT as well we did yeah we decided to take one with Bruce and um <laughs> It, it ran really, really well. You know, we, we built the thing. We never went to a test day. We went shot off down Bray Hill as the very first time we rode the motorbike. Really? And um, we actually did, in fairness, do about probably two or 300 yards on it, two or 300 metres up an estate That's where enough. we finished building it. And Bruce came back to you, Bruce, how's it feeling? Yeah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> off, off we went down Bray. And he did 128.7 or something on his very first standing start lap. But then later in the week on the Wednesday, had a little fuel pump issue um, and, and it slowed down the development there um, but when we took it to the Ulster in 217 um, Bruce had an incredible win there Peter won the Thruxton round of the BSB Peter Hickman that is won the Thruxton round of BSB on the Sunday and on the Saturday at um, 
at uh, the uh, Ulster Grand Prix the week after, Bruce passed uh, Peter on the last lap and won the motorbike race. A 48-year-old guy <laughs> who qualified on pole, uh, did the, broke the lap record on every single lap. I think he brought it five laps. At each, each consecutive lap, he broke it five times. And, and there's a little story there, which I'm sure Bruce won't mind me telling you. I spoke to him last week, actually. Hopefully, mate, if you... Well, you won't watch this. I know what you like. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was going to say, let's get, you, let's get you there on Friday night, mate. Um, he knows where I'm coming from on that one. Um, and um, we, we went out for tea on the... Uh, after the, the lads call it on the Thursday there, the race on the Thursday at the uh, Dundrod circuit. The Dundrod 100 or whatever. It's, it's not an international. It's the... Um, uh, the national race, Steve, isn't it? And um, we, Bruce finished third in that one, the superbike race on the Thursday. And uh, we went out for tea down the Ballymac. And he sat next to me on the left here. My dad's on my right. And he leant over. He said, I'll win the big race on Saturday. And if you've got Bruce Anstey, 48-year-old, 40 year t- telling you to win the race, <coughs> a 16-year-old kid tells you, you believe him for a second. And then you think that's just his enthusiasm. Yeah. And uh, he said, that's what makes you say that, mate. He said, I would, I would just get my eye in today watching him. <clears throat> Excuse me, and sure enough, uh, Saturday came and he, he he big screen TV there at the start and finish, and he drops back just before Joe is, and I think he's stopping. He's got his eye up now, and afterwards I discussed. Well, we discussed it before the race. In fairness, when he might do it, but not where. And um, he uh, he said, yeah, he said I just needed a bit better run through there. He was holding me up. <laughs> and um, so he, to get a run through and shoot up the hill, yeah. you know, up towards Wheelers and so on, and. Um, no, Bruce Anstey's absolutely incredible. His uh, his talent level is second to none. Mm-hmm. If if he was around with Mark Marquez when he was twenty seven and fit, Mark might not have been world champion. Bless your heart, Mark. Um, Bruce yeah. is some Bruce is some talent. Hey, just on the, you know on that, it was going to be one of my questions because obviously you know we all know Bruce. Um, he's not normal for sure. Um, <laughs> But uh, he's way. not on social media. Yeah, in a great in a way. way. You know, um, he's not on social media. You never hear. See, how is the boy at the moment? He's on good form. He really is on good form. Yeah, I spoke to him, as I say, three days ago. And uh, where are you? I'm out delivering because he's a white van man delivering parcels. Mm-hmm. And he saw that as a way initially. Uh, sure, you've got to earn some pennies to continue the rest of your life. You know, that's the sad spot with our industry, as Steve will tell you. You know, if he'd earned millions, he perhaps won't be here doing this today. Um, but mm. the sport doesn't pay people like they deserve that is a fact um, you yeah. know it's, it's not tennis it's not football but we all love it and um, he uh, initially thought it would help with his recovery loading a van with small parcels in and out jumping around delivering them um, in terms of his fitness level again um, but uh, no he tells me he's going for blood tests a lot less regular now and hopefully you know the cancer's away for the minute let's hope it stays away yeah let's yeah. hope so just going back going back to that <clears> motorbike <throat> The TT, by far the most demanding on any bike, let alone what is essentially a bespoke, one-of-a-kind race bike. How, What were you doing to prepare that bike to make sure it didn't just fall to bits at the bottom of Bray Hill? Or, or was it just such a soundly built bike? No, it wasn't. What pe- people misinterpret, and it's very, very much like, a, you know, it has the DNA of a, of a RCV race bike, mm-hmm. no question. But of course, it's got indicators, it's got lights, it's got a, a rev limiter on the ECU where it doesn't rev, it revs two or 3,000 RPM less than the GP bikes. It's got springs, it's not got pneumatics, it's got a lower compression, it's got an extra piston ring, it's got uh, aluminium crankcases, it's got a starter motor. It's a beautiful, beautiful motorbike, but it still had to be made into some form of race bike. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I looked at the yokes and I changed the yokes and looked at the link and... We, we just looked at, again, I think it's experience. I looked at the balance of the bike. I'd stand it, stood there. One of the guys holding out. Um, mm, yeah, where are we now? Let's just eye the fork level, eye the seat height. Mm-hmm. Um, things like radiator brackets that I looked at that were aluminium. I thought, that one's making in steel. So, you know, I had them copied in steel. The exhaust pipe bracket was lovely aluminium. I had it copied in steel because I knew that at some stage that could fail around the island. Mm-hmm. Um, I ran it without silencers on and it ran better. Uh, when I ran it on the dyno and um, so I went out of my way and I managed to get one damaged HRC will uh, play hell with the team that I got it from but I managed to get one uh, RCV proper silence instead of the kit silencer that comes in the yep. package and I got the silencers copied £1,100 and um, 
uh, because it's terribly hard to roll uh, titanium, as you probably know. And, I have no um, idea. Yeah. Clive. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so I got I've some crashed it. Look alike, uh, yeah, <laughs> look alike silencers on there, and and we just got the bike working better. And I think that uh, over the short period of time that we ran it, by the time we got it to the old street, it was actually going quite well. Amazing. Yeah. Right, let's wrap part one up there, and we'll come back. So I want to talk future of the TT, future <clears> of Pagets, <throat> and. Um, if we ever think Connor Cummins is going to win a TT on your bike. I would not doubt it one little bit, mate. Connor, you and I both know it's 132 days today, buddy. You keep pushing. <laughs>